5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. À l'image. Décollage. Good evening. And uh, before I go any further, the very brilliant object in the western sky after sunset really is the planet Venus. This is an exciting time in space research. We now have the first results from the Galileo probe, which plunged into Jupiter's clouds last December and sent back data for 57 minutes, and that's the point where it went in. Uh, in that time, the pressure increased from 0.3 of an Earth atmosphere to 23 times, and the temperature ranged from minus 220 Fahrenheit to over 300 Fahrenheit. And by then, it had penetrated to 100 miles depth and encountered winds of over 300 mph. Of course, it was then destroyed. But meanwhile, it sent back some very interesting data. We'd expected to find a layer of ammonia crystals, and we did. Then ammonium hydrosulfide, and we did. But below that, we expected to find a layer of water or water ice crystals, and with that, there was no sign. So we may have to do some rather radical rethinking. Of course, the orbiting section is now going around Jupiter, sending back pictures of the planet itself and the various satellites, including the highly volcanic Io, which has turned out to have a magnetic field. And we'll send you those pictures as soon as we get them. Certainly, Galileo has been a success. Of course, there are various other probes now active. The Ulysses probe was launched some time ago and is now going around the sun and is sending back data about the sun's poles, which have not been properly studied before. We can't see them well from the Earth. But at the end of last year, two very important probes were launched, ISO and SOHO. Now, to discuss those, who better to join me than one of our most regular and welcome visitors, Dr. Paul Murdin. Oh, Paul, welcome back to Sky at Night. Let's begin with ISO, the Infrared Space Observatory. That's now in station. Yes, sir. as we saw at the beginning of the program, ISO was very successfully launched from uh, French Guiana um, at the end of last year. Uh, it's now on station. It's been tested out. Everything is working. Uh, the whole mission is, um, is looking good. And in fact, it uh, looks like it's going to be a two-year mission rather than the 18-month mission that uh, was originally planned. Uh, ISO is the first um, uh, infrared observatory satellite specially designed to look at the infrared after the I I infrared survey satellite IRAS that was uh, launched a few years ago. Way back in 1983. Paul, can you say something about the importance of infrared work? Yes, um, our, our atmosphere is opaque to the infrared, Patrick. Um, uh, that's why the Earth has a greenhouse effect and that's why ground-based astronomers have such difficulty looking up through the atmosphere to celestial objects up above that radiate infrared down because all stars and all galaxies and so on radiate infrared. It doesn't get through the atmosphere. Um, uh, they radiate infrared as well as visible, just like a lamp, for example. Um, lamps radiate a whole spectrum of, uh, of radiation, um, uh, and uh, we can test for the effects of the infrared by shining uh, the light from a lamp through a prism um, and making a spectrum that we can scan from blue to red across a, a thermometer. And you can see the temperature rise um, in the thermometer as you pass into the red part of the spectrum and it, the temperature stays high um, even beyond the red where we can't see anything proving that infrared radiation uh, comes from uh, from that part of that region of the output of the lamp. Our sun, a star, radiates mostly in the visible part of the spectrum. That's why we as animals on Earth have uh, grown eyes so yes. that we can see in the visible. Right. Uh, but uh, there are cooler stars uh, that radiate um, uh, in the infrared. Uh, that's why it's important. How exactly does ISO work? Well, ISO is uh, basically a, a telescope, but not a very big telescope, a 0.6-metre diameter telescope uh, that receives infrared radiation. It's wrapped up in um, an enormous vacuum flask uh, that's filled with liquid helium to keep it cold. Uh, if the telescope was warm, it would radiate infrared radiation at itself um, and dazzle itself and wouldn't be able to see the faint stars. Um, it's so sensitive that it could see, uh, in fact, an ice cube at 100 kilometres if, if, it, if it looked at one. It's in a, um, an, a very eccentric orbit, 24-hour period, that passes uh, a long way away from the, um, the Earth, spending a long time away from the radiation belt, so you can get very long exposure data. What will I so see? Well, ISO, ISO will see uh, warm things like uh, uh, dust that's got warmed up. Uh, space is mostly empty, of course, and um, that's why it's space. Uh, but it does contain a few grains of dust or a few thousand grains of dust in, a vol in each volume the size of St. Paul's Cathedral. 
Um, uh, this dust uh, looks around in space. Um, sometimes when it's near to stars, like a cluster of stars, like the Pleiades, uh, the, uh, the Pleiades light shines on the dust and makes it reflect. Um, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has also seen dust um, in orbit around newly formed stars in Orion. Uh, the dust uh, is going to make planetary systems in the end. It shows at this, m at this time um, as uh, uh, opaque patches that hide the light of the nebula behind. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has, has also seen uh, dust gathered around black holes in the middle of galaxies, orbiting around the black holes before sort of falling down and making the black holes shine. Well, there's certainly plenty of dust, but uh, that isn't all, is it? Uh, no, I, it, I mean, the dust um, hides what's, uh, what's behind it, and one of the beauties of the infrared is that it's able to penetrate out from this dust um, to carry the message of what's behind um, uh, towards us. Um, infrared has the, uh, the property that it has a very long wavelength, and that means that it passes uh, through dust clouds easier. Ordinary visible light has a short wavelength, and that gets blocked by dust, so perhaps we can't see what's, uh, what's behind the dust cloud. Infrared radiation uh, has a longer wavelength, and it passes through the dust, and it can get to, uh, to the ISO satellite. Uh, for the same sort of reason, uh, stoplights on a car are a deep red colour so that uh, uh, you can see the stoplights e more easily through a, through a fog, fog bank. And this means that uh, we can see with ISO um, uh, through, fog, through dust clouds into, um, into the hearts of, uh, of, of galaxies. Uh, for example, uh, quasars are black holes in the middle of galaxies behind swirling clouds of, uh, of dust. And the, uh, as the dust and the gas that's there falls down onto the black hole, it makes a lot of radiation which shines um, above the, uh, the fog bank, um, above the dust bank, into the galaxy around and about, and uh, we can see uh, s some of the galaxy illuminated. Uh, the, the, uh, the geometry is just like um, a, f a fog bank with the, the sun setting. Um, the sun uh, shines uh, red through the fog, top of the fog bank and shines up into the sky uh, ab above and below. Yeah. Turner's famous picture, the fighting Temeraire. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the views of galaxies and, um, and quasars that we get, uh, like that fog bank in Turner's uh, painting, mean that uh, we can't see into the black hole, but ISO can. In fact, ISO has already seen uh, a black hole system in two colliding galaxies called the antennae. These are galaxies um, whose most prominent feature are two sort of splashes of stars that have uh, been ejected from the galaxies uh, during their collision. In the middle, there's a sort of a jumble of, um, of uh, dust and gas and newly formed stars where the galaxies are colliding together. And uh, ISO has been uh, unable to see the old stars, but it sees the, the warm new stars uh, wh whose formation has been triggered by this collision. Uh, the new star forming regions are in the uh, lower part of this uh, picture in the lower galaxy. They're the bright spots there. ISO also sees that bright spot in the upper galaxy, uh, which is uh, the black hole in the center of the upper galaxy, switched on, as it were, by the collision by stuff that's in the galaxy disturbed and falling down on the black hole. All quite fascinating. Uh, anything else? Yes, uh, closer to home, uh, during the performance verification stage of the, um, of, of the, so of the, of the ISO mission, um, the spectrometer that was made by Queen Mary and Westfield College looked at a planetary nebula called NGC 7027. Rather unexpectedly, it found um, traces of water vapor mm. in, in this planetary nebula. Uh, it was thought that, uh, that all the oxygen would actually be gobbled up by the carbon and, there wouldn't have, uh, and none would have attached itself to the, to the hydrogen and uh, made this water vapour. Um, this is telling us something about the way the star that made that planetary nebula disassembled itself during its evolution. Another bright object that uh, the performance verification stage looked at was the planet Saturn. Um, and here the uh, Queen Mary and Westfield um, spectrometer saw deuterated hydrogen gas. Uh, deuterated hydrogen is uh, a, a special form of hydrogen in which one of the hydrogen atoms has an additional neutron. And that tells us about the composition of material that was created in the Big Bang and the composition of the solar nebula that, uh, that Saturn was made out of um, four billion years ago. Or so. Well, certainly I say it was a success. In December, another mission lifted off from Cape Canaveral. This is SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory. And that is now in station. Uh, Paul, what's happening about that? Well, uh, this is a solar observatory to look at um, all aspects of the behavior of the sun. 
Uh, it, in particular, it'll look at the sun's surface. The, the sun's surface is um, a very violent place. It's got uh, uh, storms on it that heave about um, up and down and surge um, up above the uh, surface of the sun, uh, making great archways above the surface, uh, sometimes sort of being ejected off and into space in uh, what are called coronal mass ejections. Um, and uh, Soho saw one of these coronal mass ejections uh, in January with the instrument that was provided by the University of Birmingham. Well, certainly the sun is a very violent place. Also, the surface of the sun is moving up and down. Yes, the surface of the sun um, has a speed of its own, and there's an instrument on board uh, Soho to measure the speed of the surface. Uh, one of its first results is to take a, um, an image of the entire sun in which the surface of the sun is color-coded so that red parts of the sun uh, are those that are receding from us, yellow parts are those that are approaching. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the sun is rotating about its axis. Well, so, in fact, Soho has rediscovered what Galileo found way back in um, 1610. Yes, well, uh, a rather newer result is that if you subtract off this very big rotation, this very big motion from the data, um, then you can see the, uh, the granulation of the sun and the way the surface moves in, in little patches called uh, supergranulations. And these measurements that, that Soho has made are, are much newer. Uh, the Rutherford Apple Laboratory's spectrometer has been looking at these uh, supergranulations as well, uh, finding out uh, uh, how hot they are, how dense, what they're made of, and so on and so on and so on. Well, of course, at the moment, we are at the minimum of the sun's cycle of activity. There have been very few spots now for some time. Is that going to be a limitation, do you think? No, um, you certainly can't have uh, fewer spots than none, and that certainly proves that it's sunspot minimum right now. Um, uh, SOHO will last for at least six years, so it'll go into, um, into solar maximum. And during that six years period, um, it will observe the, um, uh, the oscillations of the sun. There are these big storms on the sun, of course, moving very violently with speeds of many thousands of kilometers a second, but the sun's got a gentle rhythmic heartbeat. There are sound waves inside the sun that strike it and make it ring. Like a tuning fork, in fact. Well, a tuning fork's a very simple oscillation. That uh, produces a single note, and um, that's why it's a, a, a tuning fork. The, um, uh, the sun is a more complex motion. In fact, it's more like uh, the motion of uh, uh, the surface of a, of a drum when you strike it. A very complicated uh, vibration uh, with a lot of different patterns in it. That's why a drum um, has the particular note uh, that, it, that it does. Um, uh, these uh, complicated oscillations that are seen on the surface of the sun um, are incredibly uh, complex. And you have to look at the way these, uh, these oscillations last um, and continue for a long time before you understand them in detail. Uh, solar astronomers based on the ground have been very ingenious in setting up networks of solar observatories all around the world. There's one called the Bison Network that's organized by the University of uh, Birmingham. Um, and as a station uh, in this network is uh, carried around the Earth uh, from, uh, from night to day, like the, uh, the station in uh, Sutherland in South Africa, um, it, it, it moves um, into the sun's rays, uh, open, uh, opens up, um, and is able to observe the sun. Uh, its data is combined with other telescopes in the, in the network to make a long continuous stream. Well, almost continuous, because of course sometimes it's cloudy at uh, one of the stations and sometimes the telescope breaks down and sometimes this and sometimes that. SOHO is going to look all the time for six years and find out the subtleties in this motion. Well, of course, if SOHO simply went round and round the Earth, there would be times when it passed into the Earth's shadow and data would be cut off, but it doesn't move like that. No, uh, Soho, Soho's quite unusual in that it uh, runs alongside the Earth in its orbit. It's stationed at a point called the Lagrangian point, which is where the gravitational forces of the Earth and the Sun balance. And Soho sits there watching the Sun continuously all the time. What do you think it's going to tell us? Well, it's um, uh, uh, going to tell us about the inside of the sun because the sound waves that make these oscill oscillations travel through the body of the sun in order to make the surface wave up and down. Uh, some of the sound waves travel quite near the surface. They skim along the surface. They tell us about the, uh, the upper layers, but some penetrate deep down into the interior of the sun, and they're the only means by which we can tell what the inside of the sun is really like. Because the Lagrangian points are very convenient. They're very good vantage points for studying the sun, and also they are upstream of the solar wind.
Yes, so SOHO will be able to, uh, to catch gusts of the solar wind uh, as it travels past SOHO towards the Earth and give us a warning about uh, how these uh, solar wind particles are going to uh, catch up with the magnetic field of the Earth and make it taper backwards uh, like a, a comet's tail. Um, it'll be following up the discoveries which uh, Ulysses has already made. Ulysses has measured, measured the speed at which the solar wind travels outwards from the sun. Um, it comes out um, in uh, high-speed gales uh, from the poles of the sun and in uh, gusty bursts from the equator. Ulysses has been able to see this for the first time. And uh, this is uh, telling us, for example, about the shape of the, of the nebula that the sun will leave when it's faded away. Um, uh, when the sun has gone away, uh, astronomers on planets orbiting around Alpha Centauri, for example, will be able to look at where the sun was, and they'll see a nebula which is a sort of uh, hourglass or egg-shaped, uh, pinched in at the waist. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has already uh, been able to uh, see this in, in other nebulae, uh, like the Eta Carina Nebula. Uh, this sort of pinched-in waste effect is uh, quite common among, uh, among uh, other nebulae. Well, two very successful satellites. Next comes Cluster. What about Cluster, Paul? Yes, um, the spectacular year in space is, uh, is not over, and at this moment, uh, technicians in French Guiana are uh, uh, testing the very first Ariane 5 rocket to be launched. Uh, they've rolled it out onto the, uh, onto the launch pad and uh, tested it there, um, even ignited the, uh, the engines, uh, and it's scheduled to take off in May with uh, the cluster mission. Uh, this is a, a mission with four satellites, in fact, which carry instruments made in the United Kingdom uh, and throughout Europe. These four satellites will shoot like peas out of a pea shooter um, into space and go into synchronized orbits ar around uh, the Earth. Um, they'll, um, they'll measure the uh, response of the Earth's magnetic field to, solar, to the solar wind. So we've had Ulysses over the past few years measuring how the solar wind works and how the, uh, the poles of the sun work. We have SOHO on station now looking at the surface of the sun and catching the solar wind. And uh, we'll have cluster over the next, um, over the next few years uh, testing how that solar wind interacts with our own environment uh, here on Earth. And at the end of it all, we want to know much more about the sun than we do now. Paul, thank you very much. Now, don't forget, if you want the latest information, then you can phone our information line, 0891 8330, or you can dial up CFAX, page 615. Now, at the end of this month, we may have a really bright comet, Pukataki. You never quite know with comets, but it does look good, and round about the end of the month, it should be high in the sky, it may be bright, it may have a long tail. And uh, in hopes, we're going to do a special Sky at Night program on March the 24th, all about this comet. So let's only hope the comet doesn't fail us. And until then, good night. And more results from the SOHO spacecraft will be announced in early May.